Welcome to the Earth's Edge podcast. I'm your host, James McManus. At Earth's Edge, we run guided expeditions with a focus on environmental and cultural sustainability. We created this podcast to share stories from people who have found the outdoors and fallen in love with adventure. Each month, we're giving away one of our summit jackets worth 150 euro. To be in the running, all you need to do is subscribe to our mailing list at earths-edge.com forward slash podcast. There's a link in the show notes. Now for today's guest. So I have to say, I just really loved the sense of camaraderie between us as well. And if someone's having a bad day, you like cheer them on and egg them on. And then if I was having a bad day, someone say to me, come on, you know, you're fine, keep going. And so I just really loved the whole like, I didn't have a clue what was going on in the real world for three weeks, and that was like the best thing ever. You're listening to Rachel Kiernan, whose first international trek was to Mira Peak. At six and a half thousand meters, it's one of the highest trekking peaks in the world. Rachel talks about why she loves getting out in the hills and why she took on this mountain with no previous altitude experience. We also chat about her mountain leader training and joining Mountain Rescue. We start out discussing our trip together in 2018 and what motivates her to keep challenging herself. So let's dive in there. So Rachel, we met in 2018 on Mira Peak. For those of you that don't know, Mira Peak is the highest trekking peak in Nepal. It's six and a half thousand meters high or 21,000 feet for all of our American listeners out there. Mira Peak is a 20 t- 23 day trip. It's a proper mission. You got a 10 day hike through the mountains into base camp mm-hmm. and we spent three days in snow and ice. And it was your first big mountain, right? Yeah. Yeah. First time to altitude. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. Like, so most people would do something easier first, like Kili or Everest Base Camp. And from my memory, you were pretty comfortable the whole way around. How did you get involved in that trip? I was actually meant to do Everest Base Camp with yourselves, with another group, and they decided not to go with yourselves. So I wasn't comfortable not going without um, a high altitude doctor. And then two of my friends were like, oh, we've actually like looked at Mare Peak and we've booked it. And I was like, oh yeah, grand, looked at the itinerary. I was like, that seems doable. And just booked it then without thinking and just went from there then on a big adventure. <laughs> and did you have any like previous hiking experience before Mare Peak? I've only hiked in Ireland prior to that and I did one hike in Canada, but it's only slightly higher than Karen Tool, so it'd be pretty similar height wise. So that was it. That's all I had prior to going out to Nepal. So limited maybe. You had done some hiking in Ireland, like you'd done like stuff around Wicklow and all that. Or did you just start hiking in the training or had you done hiking back in the day as well? Like how I got into hiking was through the the Guard Four Peaks Challenge and that's how I actually got into it. So I'd done Karen Tool and all that kind of stuff, but I suppose if we're going on an expedition, you might just think maybe I hadn't done enough like experience wise. Yes, yeah, so I don't like Mallory and all them. So that was my experience prior to going. Deadly. And so when you signed up for the trip, when you initially decided you were going, like what kind of training were you doing at that time? So I was hiking regularly enough, like I was probably out um, maybe once a week. And then from there, then I was like looking at it. So I was like, right, okay, I need to kind of go out for longer durations just to build up stamina. And then I worked on breathing techniques and then I'm a qualified yoga teacher as well. So I was implementing yoga as I went. And then I was really researching like altitude and how to lower your heart rate so you don't sweat and your body's not under exertion. So I was actually doing deep belly breathing as I was like going up a steep incline to keep my heart rate down at a certain level so it wasn't popping out of my chest trying to climb so that was all the kind of stuff I started doing then in preparation for Mira. Unreal I was going to ask you about your yoga was that a big help to you on Mira Peak? Yeah massively because a lot of people only shallow breathe into their chest um, and then obviously if you're only doing that and then you're trying to like obviously go to altitude then your breathing is massively affected so I found because I was already in a really good habit of deep belly breathing I was getting more oxygen into my body and it would reduce me kind of getting short-winded because instead of going to the chest I was going straight to the belly and then I was working on meditating visualization then so I watched a video of an Australian guy Summit Mare Peak and I still listen to that song to this day he had the rogue traders playing on the video and as a song saying I'm falling in love again and it just reminded me I'm falling in love again with the mountains over and over and over again so when I saw him summiting Mare Peak I was like right 
what would I be feeling if I was in his position? And I would just conjure up those emotions in myself. And then I started putting pictures of the summit of Mare Peak on my wardrobe. So anytime I got up for a training hike and if I wasn't kind of in the humour, I'm like, but that's my goal. I was like, I want to be there and I want to have that emotion, and that experience. So I have to say visualisation was a massive part of my goal because I'd already placed myself at the top. So then it was just doing it in real life then really so all those combined it was a great combination I have to say that's deadly that's so interesting that's so cool fair play to you mm-hmm. do you enjoy training or is it something that you struggle to do I like training once it's something that I'm really into but I like something that will challenge me physically and mentally I don't like just doing something just for the physical exertion I need that mental challenge so like when I first started hiking at times like you're trying not to doubt yourself because you'll get to a certain point and you're like oh my god am I not at the top yet and as your body might be like screaming at your brain like oh you have to stop and then you're having this little battle in your head no no I'm not giving up I'm not stopping and just building up that resilience and that confidence in your own ability to go, no, well, I've done Karen Tool before. So say if I was doing it again, I'm like, no, well, I've got to the top. I can do this. So I love stuff that just pushes me and then it pushes me outside of my comfort zone. And then when you're outside of your comfort zone, that's when you really start to learn more about yourself and learn more skills. And then you can definitely implement that in all aspects of your life then because... You're like, well, I took on that challenge and I completed it. Yeah, so it has to be something that challenges me mentally as well as physically, I'd have to say now, exercise-wise. So. Cool. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Like, I think when you come back off a big mountain like Mirror Peak, you have that little bit of swagger about you, a bit of confidence, you know, which is great. Like, I mean, I'd, I'd be the same, yeah. you know, you come back <laughs> and you're like, yeah, um, all the climatized to like six, 7,000 meters and you're like skipping along at sea levels. And were you always tough? Do you always have that mental toughness and physically have the ability to push yourself were you always like that? Well, I suppose maybe in secondary school I was and like I got bullied a lot in secondary school. I kind of found that a little bit hard because obviously you, you want people to like you and accept you. So I kind of found that hard. But then I kind of just started building on myself and I started giving myself like little goals just to build myself up a little bit confidence wise. So I really kind of progressed on from that then. And the more I started achieving stuff, I was like, okay, well, I can do the next thing that life throws at me and do the next thing and just kept building on from there. So I have to say, compared to the person I am now, compared to the person in my 20s, I'm completely different. As in, I still have the same personality, but I'm more resilient. I more kind of have self-awareness about myself, but I believe myself as well. So if I'm going to do something, like I know I'm going to do it. Like I might have to figure out how I'm going to do it, but I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm going to go off and do that. And Usually my dad says, if I say I'm going to do something, I am going to do it. And that's it. It's done in my head. Then I just have to do it physically. It does take a while to build it up. But yeah, it's definitely well worth being aware of yourself and just building up your own kind of skills. Yeah, that's so true. I share that with you. Like once I say I'm going to do something, I'm, I'm doing it. Like, you know, I, I'd hate to say I, I would do something mm. and then not deliver on it. You know, it's when people ask me what mountains I'm going to do, I'll like, I'll tell you when I'm on the way back down, you know, because... This is probably a little bit negative, but uh, yeah, I could definitely relate to that. Like um, your 20s, you know, you're you're kind of figuring stuff out. You know, I'm well into my 30s, like heading closer to 40 now. I've definitely enjoyed the 30s a lot more than my 20s um, in so many ways, especially for me when I was kayaking so much at a high level. Like I was doing it for a long time just because that's what I sort of see myself as doing rather than actually really loving it when I when I got into it first. So it's nice to kind of do less of that now and transition to climbing big mountains, which is my current passion. And I'm going to keep doing yeah. that until until I stop enjoying it, you know, so it's it's great at the minute. Yeah. Just to go back a little bit again then. So prior to Mira Peak, what challenges had you done? You Was it a big jump to do Mira Peak? Prior to the Four Peaks, um, I did a charity walk from Galway to Dublin. So that was over four days. Um, so I ended up on crutches at the end of it because <laughs> uh, I was that sore from it. Okay. Um, so I was kind of doing stuff like that and I kind of like, right, well, I've done that now. What's the next thing I can get stuck into? And I just saw the four peaks thing and uh, I was like, geez, I've never climbed any mountains in Ireland. That's a great way to do it. I saw no problem with this whatsoever <laughs> until I started hiking. And I was like, OK, you know, it's a different level of fitness. I kind of just learned from people around me then and I really just got into it then. It was just the feeling when you got to the top, like the first mountain I climbed in Ireland was Cairn Tool. And when I got to the top of that mountain, well, I was as proud as punch and the smile on my face and the sense of achievement. And it was just really worth it. And that saying that says like after the hardest climb comes the best view. And that goes for every aspect in your life. You know, if you're going through a tough time, 
there is the other side of it where you come out and that's like me for mountains when I get to the top of that mountain it's just like the best feeling ever so um, I think the Four Peaks really prepared me though for Mare Peak because I did it in three days so that's quite tough if you've never come from a hiking background I only started training in October 2016 and in May 2017 then I completed the Four Peak Challenge okay yeah so I was out a lot training for that and we had done a weekend where we climbed Crowpatrick, Mallory, stayed overnight, did Mallory the next day. So I did a lot of that kind of stuff as well in preparation for the four peaks. And then doing the four peaks, then I think just gave me a great basis then to go on and do Mary Peak or kind of any, any altitude. A year later, you did Mary Peak. Yeah. When did you walk from Galway to Dublin? That was in, I think I did that in 2015. I think I had a year's gap between, so 2016 was kind of like my year off until I like set my sights on the next big challenge (laughs) you were saying you were on crutches after that hike yeah what happened there it's just my foot anytime I went to put my foot down on the ground the pain would just shoot up so I ended up having to finish on crutches because I can be like so determined I don't like to give up unless I really have to but at the same time I do understand my own limits within my body so if I know I physically can't do something I will stop like I'm not gonna put myself to such an extreme that I'll injure myself or anything but it was just the bones of my foot and everything they were just sore from that length of mileage and everything so a few days rest then I was grand and you know forgot the torture and then it was like I'll sign up to the next thing then oh total respect like it's funny the way you're saying like it's funny too hard I will stop and there you are like hobbling on crutches over the finish line you're like yeah no this is totally cool I'm not injured here yeah. so come here how was Mira Peak tell us about that trip like I have to say like even though you had the itinerary it really doesn't explain like how magical it is the experience alone like going to Kathmandu and exploring that is so different compared to Ireland and the locals were just so nice and what I loved about the expedition there's only nine of us as in the people that are hiking then obviously we had our guide which was yourself and then we had the doctor and then you have your you know the Sherpas helping you and everything but I just loved the way that the group was so small itself and we'd gone off the beaten track so there was only us the locals you know our Sherpas helping us it's just so nice we were like a little family playing card games reading books sitting by the fire talking about different experiences you had no mobile phone very limited wi-fi you know it wasn't even worth going onto the wi-fi uh, no electricity, um, but you had these fabulous tea houses. Like, I'm still amazed how they just made everything, how they get everything up to themselves. They're so, like, self-reliant and self-efficient. The Sherpa community is just amazing. And they're just so nice. And any questions you had or you needed anything, they just did it. So I have to say, I just really loved the sense of camaraderie between us as well. And if someone's having a bad day, you, like, cheer them on and egg them on. And then if I was having a bad day, some say to me, come on, you know, you're fine, keep going. And so I just really loved the whole like back to bases element. And I didn't have a clue what was going on in the real world for three weeks. And that was like the best thing ever. And then I loved going to high camp and then summit day. It was just being on the glacier and everything. That was just a different level altogether. I was like, I really like winter mountaineering, I think. <laughs> After that, <laughs> I was like, this is great. So yeah, loved it. Every minute of it. Yeah, you were really strong. Like obviously people sign up as individuals on these trips, but they kind of come a small family in some cases and everyone has their tough moment, their tough day. Like, but you kind of pull through together. It's an amazing bond. It's actually really interesting. Obviously we have a doctor and often like on tented trips, you know, let's say in Kilimanjaro where we have like a big mess tent. If anyone has an issue, the doctor would have to chat to them, you know, but it'd be like when you go out and and chat to the doctor, when you come back in, everyone is asking you and the doctor, like, are you OK, you know, mm. and, and they want to know you're right and all that, which is fine most of the time. But if it's a problem of a personal nature, you're just like, oh, God, just just, you know, leave it, leave it to themselves. But uh, mm. that trip that we had, um, it definitely was like two different expeditions or even three, you know, because we had a 10 day walk in mm. and you got the three days up in the glacier and then we have another three days walking back out again. So it's a proper mission. Like, yeah. I think it's cool. It was your first trip. What was the toughest part of the trip for you? I have two kind of, I suppose, tough moments. The first one now, I don't think was actually as bad as my second one, but the first one was when I kind of was unwell, as in stomach issues, just obviously some sort of, not necessarily bad food, but something obviously just didn't agree with me. So that day, I think it was only our second day in and I hiked for eight hours with no food, only drinking sips of water. And I was like at the back of the group, which, which is fine anyway. It doesn't bother me necessarily being at the back of the group. But it just, I wasn't in 
my usual kind of, you know, rhythm. So that was kind of tough, not necessarily that day itself, but then the knock on day because I wasn't really, you know, there was no point in eating food. So then the next day my reserves were kind of gone. So I was like really tired the next day, but like still played on. And then I suppose my really bad day was the second last day. We were kind of in no man's land in my head. Like psych- psychologically, we were in no man's land because we had summited, which was fine. Got down to 5,000 metres. That was fine. That was a purpose. But then the middle day, we had to get to this tea house in order so that we could get on to the final day to get down to Lukla. So I just found that day was just like no man's land. And like we were going up down and like Irish flat and Nepali flat, they're two different things. And they're like, oh yeah, like it's only this time. And I'm like, is this Nepali time or Irish time? Like, because obviously they walk at a completely different speed to us. So one point after lunch, I love the picture. I actually have it stuck up on my wardrobe. There's me, Grace, Moira and Barry. And all of our heads are down and our eyes are closed in the tea house at lunchtime. And that was just a pure representation of what that day was. And uh, after lunchtime, I was like, are we ever going to get to this tea house? And I knew any time we went up, we had to drop back down. And when we dropped back down, I was like, I can't see this tea house. And then I was really just trying to fight with myself mentally, like, just keep going. It's going to be fine. But the minute I got into that tea house, I just burst into tears. And then I think it was either Grace or you or someone was like, right, get her a bottle of Coke. Because I was just like, I need a bottle of Coke, Cola, get the sugar back into me. So yeah, that was my worst day, like really, I think. And I think it was just because psychologically in my head, I had done what I wanted to do, which was obviously to summit. But then you do have to get back down. And I just felt that day in between, I was just like, what is going on? Like, we are in no man's land. So from that point of view, I think that was my worst day. That I suppose that was more of a mental aspect as opposed to a physical aspect. Because my body was fine. Like, I wasn't even sore from after summiting merit, which I couldn't believe. I was like, geez, I'm great. (laughs) You know, no soreness or anything is purely from a psychological point of view. I think that was just, yeah, the toughest day. Yeah, like absolutely. Just to explain to the listeners, the walk into base camp on Mira Peak takes about 10 days because we take a kind of a roundabout route to acclimatize and gain altitude slowly. But on the way back down, we can come come back out to Lukla in three days because we cross the Satra La Pass and we kind of traverse around the mountains. And it kind of is flat, like when you compare it to like an 8,000 meter peak, which mm. is right there, Everest or four or five of them, it's kind of like, it is hills until you're actually walking on it and you're bollocks tired and you're like, dude, this is hilly, you know? <laughs> yeah. What surprised you on the trip? I think maybe the close bond that I made with everyone and that I learned so much about myself as in I'm well able to put myself outside of my comfort zone. And yes, it was great. I had two friends on the trip with me, so that did make it easier in that regard. But even that, I was able to chat to everyone. Everyone was so friendly. But like that, obviously, I can't control altitude, you know, no one can. But as you said, control the controllables, you know, and if you just implement everything, you can really see that you can you can get to the top of that mountain. So I knew I was going to summit it, obviously, provided I didn't get altitude sickness or anything. So I wouldn't say I was very surprised. It was just that feeling with everyone at the top and the emotion and that bond. But like we will always have that bond because it was like, yeah, I remember this day or I remember that day. And I think it was just really walking away from that trip, the bond with everyone. You couldn't ask for a nicer group of people to be with to share that experience. Let's take a break there for some quick fire questions. What was your first job? Oh, uh, working in Delhi. What song is always on your workout playlist? Britney Spears. <laughs> nice. What are you reading right now? I just finished Atomic Habits, which is very good. Okay. Mm. If you were stranded on a mountain with one celebrity, who would it be? Oh, that's a toughie now. I say Aunt Middleton. Okay. Yeah. I know who that is. Obviously not, like, but anyway. You climbed Everest. Um, you should know this. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm always following people who climb mountains. It's my, my big pastime in life. <laughs> What's your favourite food to eat on a mountain? Oh, uh, I like the veggie dalba, actually. That was good. Mm, veggie dalba's the mm. job, yeah. Mm. What's your favourite piece of kit? Oh, my rab jacket. Your down jacket? Yeah. That big, you yeah. know, the big minion, as I call it. Oh, your big yellow one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll actually have to put your photo on the, the yellow jacket as your like yeah. your podcast <laughs> image. Yeah, for sure. I love that jacket. It's like a onesie almost. It's yeah. huge. What's your biggest pet peeve when traveling? When traveling, really slow people. Okay. Obviously lunch. not when they're going to high altitude because that's, no, that's good. No, no. But, uh... but I mean as in, in the security line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> if money wasn't a factor, what would you do all day? I'd go traveling. 
Nice. Yeah. And finally, describe yourself in three words. Resilient, positive, outgoing. Deadly. That was great, dude. Thanks, Amel. Do you ever listen to like sports documentaries or books about sport when they talk about like a winning team when they're in the dressing room mm. after winning a trophy or like a Six Nations or a Premier League or an All Ireland and they're like, you know, there's a bond mm. and that special feeling where you've achieved something together and it's always a connection you have. I think climbing big mountains is a little bit like that in the sense that, you know, you were kind of there and you got to experience it. I suppose like when those guys are sitting in a in a in a dressing room and they're like mm. cracking champagne or beer or whatever, like we still have a long way to go to get back <laughs> off the mountain, you know. So it's yeah. a little bit different in some ways and it's like minus ten or fifteen, but I think it is. I think that's really cool actually what you mentioned that about the bond on it. I also notice myself like sometimes especially a long trip like over twenty days like that, I often make a lot of like quite significant life changes post expedition can sometimes be around like dealing with difficult people or you know your own negative change in habits or doing stuff more positive what's your experience there like did you have that from other challenges or did you make any big changes post mirror peak i think going on that type of trip is kind of life-changing in some aspects really i do think and when i came back i actually just appreciated stuff a lot more obviously they don't have electricity bar cap and do but like when you're on the mountains they're very limited and i was kind of like Jeez, I really take some stuff for granted, like a light switch, just turn on the electricity, really taking that for granted or the fact I had running water. It just kind of gave me a whole new appreciation for stuff. And I was like, I really shouldn't kind of take this stuff for granted. And then I was like, I really need to travel more and I need to do more stuff. And life is too short for just doing your work and not in a bad way, but you need to get out there and don't be put off by something like, oh, I can't do this or I can't do that. And my biggest saying is, take a positive from a negative. So if something negative has happened to you, find the positive in there. There's a positive reason as to why something has happened and just use that to spur you on then. Or as Ant Middleton said in one of his books, use your enemy as your energy, which is another great saying. I'm like, yeah, I really like That's that. Great. Yeah. But yeah, I have to say, it just gave me a deeper sense of appreciation. I have to say when I came back from that trip, I wouldn't say I necessarily made any life altering decisions, maybe consciously, but definitely subconsciously, it massively impacted me and it's just spurred me on then just to go above and beyond and do more stuff and, you know, maybe contemplate doing a winter mountaineering skills course at some stage, definitely, for sure. Yeah, that'd be that'd be great. So, come here, you joined Mountain Rescue. When did you do that? So, last year, actually, I was on a hike with Ross Purcell down in Mayo. We're doing Mallory. And the guide on it, he's involved in Mountain Rescue. And I'd done Mallory before, and it was only me and him that had done Mallory before. And so he's like, grand, up with me. So that was grand. So kind of halfway across Mallory from Silver Strand side or the Silver Beach side, I kind of coughed a few people had kind of fallen back a little bit. So I just said to the guide, I was like, do you want me to be sweeper for you? So basically sweeper is um, just for your listeners. The guide will look back at me and see I'm the last person. There's no one beyond me. So it's kind of a safety thing as well. And it was quite misty. So one of the girls, I managed to help her get up to the top of Mallory to summit. And so on the way back down, we had a mutual person that we both knew in Mountain Rescue. So we we're just chatting about that. And then I was asked afterwards, after the hike, oh, have you done your mountain skills? And I was like, no, I haven't done them. And, he, and you know, the guide and um, and, and fairness um, to Roz, she said, you know, you should definitely go on to do your skills. And I was like, okay thought nothing more of it and I got a phone call a week later asking me would I consider joining Mountain Rescue just of what I had done what obviously whatever skills I displayed there on Melry and I was like all right okay didn't even think this was an option and I was like right grand so from there then I booked on to do like my Mountain Skills 1, Mountain Skills 2, had to go for an interview process with Mountain Rescue then unfortunately stuff did get delayed due to Covid so obviously that knocked back my assessment but it knocked back all of us the recruits coming on to the team so we went out for a training day in August with them so multi-discipline day so we're split into three groups and we were doing stuff in the Owl Valley and Wicklow which was great so we were going up a gully like a really steep gully and this was like after my assessment as well so I'd spent two days out in the mountains and then it's going into my third day but it was great and then we did kind of crag work so rope work so learning how to work the ropes if you were doing like a rope access point to rescue someone and then we did first aid so then I actually did my first training session last night then official first training session at Mountain Rescue then last night which was 
uh, doing a CPR course. I already have my Rec 3, but we have to do certain stuff as well to go on to your EFR course then as well with Mountain Rescue. So yes, that's actually how they ended up going for Mountain Rescue then. Brilliant. We're actually starting to run staycation products in Ireland because of the coronavirus. So I hope I won't be calling you guys out like, yeah, we used to run Five Peaks Challenge, which is the highest mountain in Ireland, Northern Ireland, in Scotland and Wales. And for whatever reason, we did two like within a month of each other. And down in Kerry, I had one lady fall over, split her head and like as a ring of mountain rescue and like two or three guys on the rescue team work lead expeditions for me. So I was just like, oh God, come on. Like the first time we've run a, a commercial trip on current tool <laughs> and we're called them out like, and then literally a month later going up the zigzag track, someone on the mm. way up, um, really nice fellow, a friend of mine called Sean, he dislocated his knee. Oh. So I'm like back on 112 again, calling out men rescue. We had to get like a uh, rescue chopper in to evac him. Wow. Yeah, that's just the way it goes, you mm. know. As Savage, is it a big time commitment, Mountain Rescue? Yeah, for your first year, you're um, a probationary member, so you're not a full-fledged member. You have to make 80% of training, which training is every Wednesday night. And then you're out on call outs then as well. And then obviously any training that they want you to do. So there is a massive commitment. You know, you're obviously putting in your time, effort, um, and obviously then as well, they have to make sure you're a good fit for the team. And if you're not a good fit for the team, then, you know, you just won't go on to be a fully fledged member, which is fair enough in fairness, their craft and what they do. You need to be a really, really solid team. And it's a massive, massive commitment. So it is a serious commitment. You'd want to think seriously about doing it, not just kind of Oh, it'd be cool. I'll go out and rescue people. You know, it's it's not about the adrenaline rush. It's giving that commitment because you're giving your commitment to the team, really. Yeah, for sure. I saw you also did your mountain leader training recently. Yes, ML1. Yeah, I know. I'm a bit insane. I was only saying to Brian, actually, when we're coming down off our first day of ML1, I was like, well, realistically, in five and a half months, because obviously we're taking out the months that we couldn't go out in the mountains in COVID, I done my MS1, MS2, my assessment, my Rec3, and then I went on to do ML1. So I was like, really, in five and a half months, I've managed to do all that. So I was just like, a bit insane. But like, I'm happy for where I am at the moment. I know like I have a lot more work to do in order to um, go on to my ML2. I don't rush my ML2. So. And dude, you're teaching yoga as well. I haven't been doing it now the last while, but kind of the run up to Mary Peak and stuff like that. Yeah, I was doing yoga and I really kind of do little lessons with people and like that. Um, it was really cool actually to be able to actually do it in Mary as well for you guys, just to talk you through meditation and just kind of do the stretches that are required just to kind of loosen up after hiking and climbing. So hopefully at some stage I might get back teaching, but for the moment I'm just happy even helping people out that I know myself and just kind of do a meditation with them or talk them through kind of some yoga stuff to help them. It was great on the trip now. I have to say I really enjoyed it. You know, I've done yoga, but I don't practice on, on a regular basis. Yeah. But when I do do it, I really enjoy it. Mm. God, you're busy. Like you're doing a lot of different stuff. Fair play to you. Um, when you're growing up, like as a kid in primary school, did you enjoy an adventure at that point? Like even if it was in your back garden? Yeah, like me and my brother would have played out in the garden and we'd be like playing all these stuff we just made up, doing whatever, running around fields and everything. So I like the outdoors, but not to the same extreme now. Um, now, I would have been sporty and I would have been playing sports and all that kind of stuff and a lot of team sports. And I suppose hiking can be mainly seen as, well, it's an individual kind of sport. I did like the outdoors. I wasn't opposed to it, but I just didn't really realise how much I loved it till I actually started getting out and hiking and just the headspace. I just love going out, turning off my phone, well, as in put it on airplane mode because I still want to take pictures because I'm all about the pictures as well. The views and the pictures. And that's how I document my hikes is by that, you know. So I just love putting the phone on airplane mode and just getting out there. And if I want to talk to people, I talk to people. If I don't talk to people, I don't talk to people. And just kind of, I suppose at times I'm doing a, a mindfulness kind of walk and just letting my own thoughts just kind of wander away. And I actually find I come up out with solutions, actually. I'll go out on a hike. And I'll be thinking about something and then I'll just get this idea and I'm like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. You know, I'll note that. And um, so it's just great. And then sometimes I just go out and I just don't think at all. Definitely for that purpose, it's it's great. Yeah, you kind of almost marinate an issue in your mind when you're out hiking or mm. even like I do a lot of running and hill running. It's, it's the same, you know, you kind of just, you're thinking about something, but you're not getting distracted by your phone as well. It's really mm. interesting. You tend to get a lot of clarity on things, which I really like. Mm. Here's a nice question for you. Who are the biggest influence in your life and why? I suppose my dad would be an influence as in he's very committed to work and stuff like that and deadlines and 
that's kind of made me be very good at my job as in you know have a very good work ethic I suppose that was kind of passed on to me and then I suppose a lot of my friends would be good influences as in they always support me and what I do and like I'd be a little bit alternative as in I like holistic therapies and stuff like that. I don't necessarily take the simple route to something either. And I always like that challenge of stuff as well. And in fairness, I have a very close circle of friends who will always kind of inspire me and, um, you know, just kind of reassure me. Yeah, go go for it. And I have to say, Rosanna Purcell, when she said about, oh, you'd be a great mountain leader. And in fairness to her, she didn't know me from Adam back like last October. She was like, yeah, go on and do your mountain skills. And she had done mountain skills one at this stage. And she's like, you're going to be a great guide. And, you know, so if you get that from someone who doesn't even know you, but sees that potential in you or sees something in you to kind of push you on is great. And then I follow the likes of the lads in uh, SAS Who Dares Wins. I just think those lads, just what they've been through, like Jason Fox, Aunt Middleton, reading all their books. And they're like that, like Jason Fox suffered from PTSD and just kind of learning what other people have gone through, I think is massive. And I kind of really learn a lot from people like that, that have gone through like some really challenging times and kind of just put stuff in perspective for yourself as well. Then you kind of read their books and stuff that they go through. So yeah, I suppose there's not one person that, you know, would influence what I do, but the range of people. (laughs) Yeah, you're inspired yeah, from lots of yeah. different people. Yeah, that's cool. That's great. You developed a relationship with Roz. Actually, you know, we climbed Killy together in 2011. Wow. So nearly 10 years ago now. It's fantastic. It's years to go on and make mm-hmm. great success. And her hike life project is really cool. I think it's like mm-hmm. such a gift for her to be bringing people out onto mountains. It's, it's really impressive. So tell me about your plans for the future. Like talk to me about uh, big mountains. Where are you going next or what's the plan of action like? Obviously, I was meant to do Killy this year. So that kind of, you know, the old COVID put a knock to that. So yeah, hopefully Kilimanjaro next year. And then I do want to go on to other things. I'm just trying to decide what mountains I kind of want to do. And I suppose the why behind I want to do it, as opposed to just doing a mountain just for the sake of, oh, I did that mountain, you know. So definitely Kilimanjaro is definitely in the sights because um, I was actually watching a documentary from Tanzania there the other day. And I was like, oh my God, I can't wait till I do Killy because it was just showing a picture of the top of it and you're above the clouds and everything and I was like yeah that's like phenomenal so yeah so definitely that I don't know I might start looking at getting into more not necessarily technical mountains but I do like the cramp on work rope work and that kind of stuff so I might start more looking at mountains that are a bit more like that as opposed to necessarily trekking the whole time Mm. I just have to explore the options I suppose and yeah yeah absolutely make sure I make the right choice yeah yeah it sounds like you're so keen on that you've mentioned winter mountaineering there as well so that's cool Mm. so hey you to try to figure out why you uh climb mountains like do you know why you climb mountains right now a lot of time I just climb the mountains because I just love the feeling that I have when I'm out there but I suppose some people they want to do the seven sevens for a reason as in they, they want to be able to say that they've done the seven you know and then some people are doing the sevens obviously to progress onto Everest or whatever I've kind of come to the conclusion at the moment I'm not quite ready to die. So Everest is not on my list. So I was kind of, that's in the back burner for the moment. I suppose just if you're taking on a massive expedition, you need to know what your why is. And I suppose that's when you're trying to take on any challenge or when you're doing something like, what is your why? There's no point in saying like, I'll do this mountain because I can just take it off. Because then when you're actually having a hard day on the mountain, your why is not going to be strong enough as to why you're there because you will start to question yourself like why am I here what am I doing this for so when I'm picking an expedition I have to have a really good reason as to why I want to get to the top of that mountain just to make it a lot more solid so when you are doubting yourself or you're having that moment of why am I here you can say no I'm here because I want to see that view or I want that feeling which was Mara Peak you know I wanted that feeling when I saw you man at the top of Mara Peak I was like right I'm going to be the same and I'm going to you know feel that so you have to have a pretty strong why that's why I'll be selecting my mountains on the why I want to get to the top of them yeah I think the summit day on Mirror Peak for us was ugh, it was perfect wasn't it you know because we had such bad well we didn't have bad bad weather but we had a lot of cloudy low vis on the walk in mm. um, and then for summit day we just had a bluebird day with pretty much no wind still tough day but like we saw five of the six highest mountains in the world from the top we could see mm. like couple hundred kilometers in each direction it was pretty epic tell me your why for Kilimanjaro 
I think it's just I want to experience kind of what Africa is like. And then obviously I'd heard people talking about Kilimanjaro, how the porters, you get to learn so much about their culture and they have you out dancing and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, that'd be like a great experience. Um, and I suppose I'm more about the experiences as opposed to necessarily taking something off a list. Because when I found when I went to Nepal and I've been to the Maldives and when you go to different places, just the knowledge that you can gain or the stuff that you can learn from other people is just phenomenal. So when I heard that, that you're out dancing with them and you kind of get to learn a bit about, you know, their backgrounds and stuff like that. I just was like, I was like, that's, that sounds deadly. Like getting out of your tent and dancing. Like I love dancing. So getting out of your tent dancing before you go hiking and I love hiking. I was like, that's a great combination. So it's like, why wouldn't you do Kilimanjaro for that, you know, alone? Yeah, it's a good reason. It's great that you have that mindset without having been because most people are like, yeah, I want to get to the top of the mountain. But when they come back and you ask them what their best part is, like meeting the porters and every morning before we leave camp, they sing songs and have a dance. And yeah, it's just the best. It's the best fun and there's fantastic people. Mm. You're going to love that one, you know, for sure. Just before I finish up, a couple of final questions for you. What tips would you have for someone who's considering an expedition like Mira Peak or Kilimanjaro and they're just struggling to pull the trigger on it and like decide to book and sign up? Like, what would you say to that person? Just do it. You know, don't doubt yourself. In fairness, you guys, you give really good guidelines as to what kind of you should be meeting training wise. So if you stick to that, and as you said, control the controllables, there's no reason why they can't go on these expeditions and everyone starts somewhere. Fear can put off an awful lot of people. Oh, I, I can't do that. And I can't do this. But you just have to flip that mindset. Yeah, I can do it. Why Why can't you do it? You know, there's no reason. So I say just get over that initial fear. And when you book it then, the excitement, it's great because you're like, you're working towards that goal then. You have the excitement and then you're getting in the updates and then you're like packing your stuff. And it's a great adventure and it's an amazing experience. And you'll never get that experience again. So to have that experience, I think experiences are much better than buying an ornament to sit in your house. You know, the experience is far, far better. So just book it, just believe in yourself, you can do it and follow whatever you've been told to do in the instructions and you'll be fine. It's as simple as that. I think that's it, isn't it? Like life is all about the experiences. Like you can mm. have all the things like, um, as you said, ornaments in your house or nice car, nice house. Mm. But ultimately, you know, we're all on the, on the planet for roughly around the same time. And it's a pretty short time. And it's the experiences that you pack into that. It's really, it's going to count. It's going to last with you. Mm. Cool. Well, listen, dude, it was absolutely class chatting to you. It's amazing to see what you've done in like the just over two years since since uh, we were in Nepal and class to see you're doing your mountain leader and love to have you back on the podcast sometime to see how you're getting on and how everything is progressing in mountain rescue. It'd be cool to have you back on. Oh, yeah. Maybe you can chat about your Achilles trip. That'd be brilliant, yeah. Rachel, thanks a million, dude. That was awesome. Thank you so much for having me. This podcast was produced by Earth's Edge. We're a small business based in Ireland who organise big adventures all over the world. For more information about us and the trips discussed on this podcast, visit earths-edge.com or follow us on Instagram. Don't forget to sign up to our mailing list to be in the running to win one of our summit jackets. There's a link in the show notes. And while you're there, if you could subscribe and review the podcast, that'd be brilliant. I'm your host, James McManus. Thanks for listening and have a super week.